The Second World War was fought hard on several fronts, costing the life of millions of soldiers. The Battle of Stalingrad, the Normandy landings or the Pearl Harbor attack are among the most well-known events of the Second World War. The control of the sea, however, played a major role in the outcome of the war. Controlling the seas meant the supply of soldiers, the ability of landings and the survival of the population isolated in islands. One of the most crucial battles played on the seas was the Battle of the Atlantic. Started in September 1939, it became the longest continuous military campaign run till the defeat of Nazi Germany in 1945. This immense battle cost the Allies 3,500 merchant vessels, 175 warships, 741 RAF aircraft and over 72,000 lives. While for the Axis, it cost Germans and Italians a combined 800 submarines, 47 warships and about 30,000 men. Covering a major part of the naval history of World War II, it is nonetheless often overshadowed by the other events of the war. In this episode of History Pills, we are going to delve into the history of this battle and explore how it shaped the outcome of the war by allowing, among the others, Operation Overlord towards the end of the war. But first, let's go with the intro. Prior to the war, the German Navy, or if you're a German speaker, Kriegsmarine, lacked the strength to challenge the combined British Royal Navy and the French Navy, Marine National, for ruling over the seas. The formidable U-Boats fleet was not yet at its peak. It counted about 57 exemplars, with the majority of these being small and short-range Type II. Thus, the German naval strategy relied on commerce raiding using capital ships armored merchant cruisers, submarines and aircraft. In September 1939, with Germany invading Poland and the beginning of World War II, many German warships were already at sea, including most of the available U-boats and the famous Panzerschiff Deutschland and Panzerschiff Admiral Graf Spee, later nicknamed the pocket ships by the British. These ships immediately began offensive actions against British and French shipping. U-30, in breach of her orders not to sink passenger ships, sank the ocean liner SS Athenia within hours of the declaration of war and caused the death of about 100 civilians. This action clearly marked the beginning of hostilities and the beginning of the Battle of the Atlantic. British and French navies quickly reacted by immediately starting a blockade of Germany defend commercial and civilian ships from submarine attacks, the British also introduced a convoy system. The idea of moving merchandise via convoys consisting of between 30 and 70, mostly unarmed merchant ships, allowed the superior British Royal Navy to concentrate its escorts and thus increase the chances to identify German U-boats. This strategy began soon after the declaration of war and was quickly implemented on the British ISLs. However, it will be gradually extended to other areas and will eventually reach in the later stages of the war as far as Panama, Bombay and Singapore. The different proposal was tabled by Winston Churchill, at the time head of the British Navy. He sought a more offensive strategy over the convoy defensive approach. In a few weeks, he organized anti-submarine hunting groups to patrol the shipping lanes and hunt for German U-boats. This strategy, however, was quickly proved disastrous. U-boats indeed had the ability, with their tiny silhouette, to always spot the Soviet warships and submerge long before it was sighted. The carrier aircraft were little help, although they could spot submarines on the surface. At this stage of the war, they had no adequate weapons to attack them, and any submarine found by an aircraft was long gone by the time Soviet warship arrived. This terrible policy shared its problems within days. Already on the 14th of September 1939, Britain's most modern carrier, HMS Ark Royal, narrowly avoided being sunk when three torpedoes from U-39 exploded prematurely. While a few days later, HMS Courageous was sunk by U-29. 
Nonetheless, the stubborn Churchill will persist with its plans and escort destroyers hunting for U-boats continue to be a prominent technique for the first year of the war with U-boats nearly always proving elusive and the convoys denuded of the cover being put at even greater risk. On the other side of the fence, Germany proved formidable. After singing HMS Courageous, only a month later, Guten Prien, a German U-boat commander, penetrated with his U-47, the British base at Scapaflow, and sank the battleship HMS Royal Oak, immediately becoming a hero in Germany. In the South Atlantic, the situation was much different. British forces were stretched by the crews of Panzerschiff Admiral Graf Spee, which sunk nine merchant ships of 50,000 GRT in the South Atlantic and Indian Ocean during the first three months of the war. The British and French formed a series of hunting groups, including three battle cruisers, three aircraft carriers, and 15 cruisers to seek the raider and their sister, Panzerschiff Deutschland, which was operating in North Atlantic. These hunting groups, however, were vain for weeks until in early December 1939, Panzerschiff Admiral Graf Spee was caught off the mouth of the river plate between Argentina and Uruguay by a British force. After suffering damage in the subsequent action, she took shelter in neutral Montevideo harbor and was scuttled on 17 December 1939. After this initial bust of activity, the Atlantic campaign quieted down. Admiral Karl Donitz, commander of the U-boat fleet, had planned maximum submarine effort for the first month of the war, with almost all the available U-boats out on patrol in September. The level of deployment could not be sustained. The boats needed to return to harbor to refuel, to rearm, to restock supplies and to refit. The harsh winter of 1939, which froze over many of the Baltic ports, seriously hampered the German offensive by dropping several new U-boats in the ice. Moreover, Hitler's plans to invade Norway and Denmark in the spring of 1940 led to the withdrawal of the fleet surface warships and most of the ocean-going U-boats for fleet operation Weserburg. Operation Weserburg, that is the Norwegian campaign, revealed serious flaws in the magnetic influence pistol. The firing mechanism of the U-boat's principal weapon the torpedo failed consistently multiple times, giving the British chances to escape and reorganize. In fact, as though the northern Norwegian fjords gave U-boats little room for maneuver, the concentration of British warships, troop ships and supply ships provided countless opportunities for the U-boats to attack. Again and again, U-boat captains struck British targets and fired, only to watch the ships sail on, unarmed, as the torpedoes exploded prematurely due to the influence pistol, or hit and fail to explode because of a faulty contact pistol, or run beneath the target without exploding due to the influence feature or depth control not working correctly. Not a single British warship was sunk by a U-boat in more than 20 attacks. As the news spread through the U-boat fleet, it began to undermine morale. What happened to the mighty U-boats? The director in charge for the torpedo development continued to claim it was the crew's fault. However, in early 1941, almost a year later, it will be discovered that the problems were caused by differences in the Earth's magnetic field at high latitudes and the slow leakage of high-pressure air from the submarine into the torpedo's depth regulation gear. These problems would be solved by about March 1941, making the torpedo a formidable weapon again. Interestingly enough, the same problems would be encountered in 1943, that is three years later from now, by the US Navy's Mark 14 torpedo. The German occupation of Norway in April 1940, the rapid conquest of the Low Countries and France in May and June, and the Italian entry into the war on the Axis side the 10th of June 1940, had a dramatic effect on the war at sea and on the Atlantic campaign. Britain lost its largest ally, the French Navy, and was now stretched even further as it had to reinforce its Mediterranean fleet and establish a new group at Gibraltar. The U-boats gained direct access to the Atlantic via the French bases in Brest, Lorient and La Palisse, which was about 720 kilometers closer to the Atlantic than the bases on the North Sea. This 
improved their ability to hunt ships and doubled the effective size of the U-boat force. British destroyers had also been diverted from the Atlantic to support the Norwegian campaign in April and May, and later to the English Channel to support the withdrawal from Dunkirk. This, combined with air attacks by the Luftwaffe Atlantic, led to the loss of dozens of British destroyers and many more being damaged. The situation was critical for Britain. In May 1940, Winston Churchill, who had now become Prime Minister, wrote a letter to Franklin Roosevelt, at the time US President, to request a loan of 50 outdated US Navy destroyers. In exchange for the destroyers, the US was given 99 years leases on some British bases located in Newfoundland, Bermuda and the West Indies. This exchange, however, allowed, aside from receiving the destroyers, to relocate troops and resources from these bases back into Europe for fighting the Axis powers. For the Germans, on the other hand, the completion of Hitler's campaign in Western Europe meant U-boats withdrawn from the Atlantic for the Norwegian campaign now returned to the war on trade. It will take until late 1943 for the tide to turn in the Atlantic with the introduction of new weapons and tactics such as the Hedgehog anti-submarine mortar or the Tall Boy, a huge bomb able to destroy 45 concrete submarine pans built in France by the Germans. U-boats operations now launched from French bases proved to be incredibly successful. This period was referred to as the happy time by U-boats crews. U-boats aces Gunter Prien Otto Kretschmer, Joachim Schepp, Engelberg Hendras, Victor Hörn, and Heinrich Blakeroth destroyed in a few months so many British ships that they earned the status of heroes back in Germany. Between June and October 1940, in fact, over 207 Allied ships were destroyed, something which even British Prime Minister Winston Churchill later admitted in his writings to having caused him fear during the war by saying, the only thing that ever frightened me during the war was the U-boat peril. U-boat's ability to destroy the Allied ships was only limited by their spotting capacity. Frictions between the Luftwaffe and the Kriegsmarine, indeed, left the submarines most of the time relying on their limited visual detection in the vastity of the ocean. But how was an attack carried from the spotting moment to the shooting one? U-boats usually worked in groups groups known as Wolfpacks. Instead of attacking a lot convoys individually, U-boats spread over an imaginary line that intersected the most probable path convoys would usually take. Then, they searched the horizon for masts or smoke or used hydrophones to detect propeller noises. When a convoy was spotted, the U-boat would report it to the headquarters and shadow it until other boats arrived. This created a situation in which the convoy escorts had to face multiple U-boats attacking at once. Some of the most experienced commanders, such as Otto Kretschmer, would attempt to pass the escort screen and attack from within the merchantman. With the limited number of escorts and with the ASDIC, Anti-Submarine Detection Investigation Committee, that was an elementary version of the radar, not able to detect surface-level attackers and lacking target discrimination range, convoys had almost no chances. While the German pack tactic was effective, there also were a few drawbacks. One was the fact that wolf packs required extensive radio communication to coordinate the attacks. This made U-boats vulnerable to the Haftaf that will be introduced in 1942 by the British Navy and that allowed Allied naval forces to determine the location of the enemy boats transmitting and attacking them. Meanwhile, back to 1940, pack tactics were used with great success by the Germans. On September 21st, four U-boats attacked convoy HX-72, which consisted of 42 merchantmen, and sunk 11 ships and damaged two more over the course of two nights. In October, the slow convoy SC-7 with a small escort of two sloops and two corvettes was overwhelmed with 59% of its ships lost. A few days later, convoy HX-79 was attacked. It consisted of an escort of two destroyers, four corvettes, three trawlers and a minesweeper. Nonetheless, the U-boat sank a quarter of the convoys without any losses. 
By the end of 1940, the number of British ships sunk was alarming. Damaged ships took months or years to be repaired. 2 million gross tons of merchant shipping, the equivalent of 13% of the entire fleet available to the British, was indeed under repair and unavailable. To further worsen the situation, in August 1940, the Italians had established Betasum, a submarine base at Bordeaux. Now, naval cooperations in the Atlantic began between the German Kriegsmarine and the Italian Regia Marina Italiana. The Italian submarines had been designed to operate in a different way than U-boats. They were slower and lacked modern torpedo fire control, which meant that they were ill-suited for convoy attacks. However, their superior range and living standards allowed them to stay at sea longer and sail distant from the coast. Their strategy focused on hunting down isolated merchantmen on distant seas. In a few months, over 65,343 GRT were sunk. In a few occasions, combined operations also took place. On the 1st of December 1940, for example, a combined force of seven Germans and three Italian submarines attacked HX-90, sinking 10 ships and damaging three others. The situation was critical for the British, a country that heavily relied on imports of food, raw materials and other essential goods to support its war effort, was getting isolated in its own island. Rationing of food, fuel and other essential goods was introduced. In September 1939, petrol was the first commodity to be controlled. On the 8th of January 1940, bacon, butter and sugar were rationed also, and by the end of 1940, meat, tea, jam, biscuits, breakfast cereals, cheese, eggs, lard, milk, canned and dried fruit will be rationed. With fishermen at risk from enemy attacks and mines, fish prices increased. Clothing will be rationed a few months later, in early 1941. These were the darkest hours for Britain, a country fighting alone against two superpowers. What will make table turn? In the next episode, we will discuss how technology, intelligence and ingenuity will play a key role in the Battle of the Atlantic. We will cover the period from 1941 to 1945 and we'll discuss how the entrance of the US Navy shaped the continuation of the battle. Make sure to subscribe and press the bell button so that you will not miss the next episode. Check out this video to find out how Winston Churchill planned to unite France and Britain in one single country, a country with a single currency and a single passport, a country that could together fight the German invasion. But for now, thanks for watching and bye.